So students, today we are going to discuss about the small intestine and tumors. So what are the tumors which can occur in small intestine? See, it can be benign, it can be malignant. Benign tumors occurring in the small intestine are mostly adenoma. Isn't it? Adenoma is polyps which can be tubular, tubular villus, villus, which I have discussed in colonic carcinoma. Same here also. So adenomas can occur. Also lipoma, hemangioma, neurofibroma, isn't it? Leomyoma, things like that can occur in a small organ as the benign tumor. And what are the malignant tumors of the small intestine? Malignant tumors most commonly are adenocarcinoma. <coughs> These adenoma which are large in size, especially villous adenoma, they can undergo malignant change, adenoma carcinoma sequence and become malignant. Uh, adenocarcinoma arising from the epithelium. These adenocarcinoma are most commonly seen in association with Crohn's disease, celiac disease, familial adenomatous polyposis coli, uh, HNPCC, that is hereditary non polyposis coli. Incidence of adenocarcinoma of the small bowel is much higher as compared to normal population. Okay, so how this adenocarcinoma will present to you? Usually, these patients will present to you with melina or bleeding from the ulcerated area. They can also present with intestinal obstruction, sometimes in reception and leading to obstruction. Okay, so these will be the presentation. Other small intestine is carcinoid tumor. Carcinoid tumor, you know, is, arises from the HHC cells in the intestinal crypts. HHC cells in the intestinal crypts usually give rise to the carcinoid. They are small tumor usually. They can metastasize to the lymph node. In early stage patients are usually asymptomatic. Later on, they will become symptomatic. They can present to you with the Bleeding, they can present to you without intersusception and obstruction, or they can present when they metastasize to the liver with carcinoid syndrome that is a <coughs> chemically secreted 5 hydroxy indole acetic acid is high in the, in the blood of these patients, uh, and then patient will present with usually diarrhea, flushing, bronchospasm, and all, which we call carcinoid syndrome that means the carcinoid tumor has metastasized to the liver and giving rise to these sim symptoms because of various chemicals especially 5-hydroxy indole acetic acid okay so other <coughs> malignant tumor can be uh, gist gastrointestinal stromal tumor gist arises from uh, interstitial cells of kajal okay they are basically Previously, we used to call leomyoma, leomyoma sarcoma. They have got a special tyrosine kinase receptor on their cells, which can be detected by immunohistochemistry. That is CD117. CD117 receptors are present on the cells of these tumors. They are submucosal tumors. They are usually benign tumor, but if the size is big, more than 10 cm, very much hypertic figures, overexpression of CD117 in these the tubers can be malignant as well. Malignant, so it can vary from benign, intermediate to malignant. Just usually is in early stages, just is asymptomatic. But later on it can also present with mucosal ulcerates, with <coughs> melina, bleeding per rectum, with intersusception and intestinal obstruction. Okay. So these are the, and of course lymphoma can occur, T cell lymphoma, B cell lymphoma. Lymphomas can occur in the small intestine as well. Gist, most commonly seen in the stomach, then in small intestine. So these are the benign and malignant tumors of the small intestine. And patient's presentation can range from asymptomatic to bleeding per rectum, melina, and intestinal obstruction. For diagnosis, you need usually a CECT, CT scan to diagnose 
these tumors. Mm. And the treatment in most of the cases will be resection, the segmental resection. The lesion, 5 cm, both proximal and distal, and mesentery and lymph nodes, if they are involved. Segmental resection and end to end anastomosis will be the treatment. Okay, so this is in short about benign and malignant tumors of the small intestine. You see, just after resection, and if there's uh, chances of being malignant, we put them on tyrosine kinase receptor inhibitor, which is imartinib, imartinib for a prolonged period of time, two to three years. Okay. Now, <coughs> what are other conditions of a small intestine? One is diverticular, hmm? especially the most common is Meckel's diverticular. Let's talk about Meckel's diverticular. You see. There is a mnemonic of two in this. Meckel's diverticulum occurs in about 2% of population. It occurs in male to female ratio, 2 is to 1. It occurs 2 feet from the ileocecal wall, that is at about 60 cm in the ileum. It is usually about 2 inches long, that is about 5 cm. Mm. Okay. <coughs> Meckel's diverticulum is basically a true diverticulum. What I mean by true diverticulum? True diverticulum means it contains all the layers of the bowel wall. From mucosa to serosa, it has all the layers of the bowel wall. So it is a true diverticulum. It arises basically from Whitlow intestinal duct. You know there is a Whitlow intestinal duct uh, uh, which is obliterated during 10th week of gestation, but sometimes it can persist and can lead to various conditions. It can lead as a band from the ileum to the umbilicus, can lead as a cyst or as fistula or uh, Meckel's diverticulum is one of them, isn't it? So Meckel's diverticulum arises from the vitreo intestinal duct. It is a congenital condition, it is a true diverticulum. And <coughs> so how do the patient presents with Meckel's diverticulum? Usually they are asymptomatic. They don't have any symptoms. But sometimes what happens, you see, Meckel's diverticulum can become inflamed and it is called diverticulitis. Meckel's diverticulitis can occur. Or if there is a band from the tip of the Meckel's to the umbilicus, the small bowel can rotate on it and lead to intestinal obstruction. Isn't it? Sometimes you see what happens. There is heterotopic mucosa, means mucosa which is not normally supposed to be present there, but it is present there. In the Meckel's, it is usually gastric mucosa. Gastric mucosa present at the diverticulum. Sometimes pancreatic mucosa is present. So if suppose a patient has got gastric mucosa present at the um, Meckel's diverticulum, it can lead to peptic ulceration, it can lead to bleeding, isn't it? So patient can present to you with bleeding per rectum, with melina, with peptic ulcer-like symptom, with diverticulitis, with obstruction, these will be the presentation of Meckel's diverticulum. So, if patient becomes symptomatic, then we have to remove it. You can remove it with open method, with laparoscopic method. How do we diagnose Meckel's? We usually we need a ultrasound or CT scan will be better. A CCT, CT scan will be better and it will tell you about there is a diverticulum in the eye. And the treatment will be obviously diverticulectomy. Mostly the safest is to reject with a, a segmental resection of a small bowel with a, a margin one centimeter on this on both sides, proximal and distal, reject it and do anastomosis. Because if there is heterotrophic mucosa present and you just do diverticulectomy, you will miss the heterotrophic mucosa. So it is better to do a resection and anastomosis, especially if heterotrophic mucosa is present or if it is wide mouth diverticulum or if there is induration at the base of the diverticulum then preferred treatment would be segmental resection and anastomosis okay so that finishes Meckel's diverticulum and then we will discuss about a small intestinal uh, short bowel syndrome you see sometimes in many conditions we reject a small bowel as in intestinal obstruction gangrene ischemia Crohn's things like that so normally small intestine is about average 5 meters long. If less than 200 centimeter is left, then the patient can develop malabsorption syndrome and all 
and we call it short bowel syndrome. Okay, short bowel syndrome. Less than two meters of a small bowel and lead to short bowel syndrome. The patient will have malabsorption of various uh, nutrients and vitamins and all and will have all sorts of problems and you will have to replace it with mostly TPN for a time being total parental nutrition, internal nutrition and so on and so forth. Okay, so this basically I think this finishes our small bubble leftovers. Then we will next time we will switch over to stomach. Thank you.